Hi, welcome to We'll Tell You What We're Reading, the monthly show where we tell you what we're reading. I'm Amber Harvey. I'm one of the librarians here at the library. And joining me are my colleagues, Greg Carter and Louise Goldstein. As always, there's a lot going on at the library. In-person programming is back, but we are still offering some virtual programs as well, many of which are featured on the library's YouTube channel. So please hit like and subscribe in order to get notifications about our great programs. In addition to this book discussion, we also offer an interactive discussion on Zoom each month, which gives you a chance to hear from your fellow patrons and library staff alike as we talk about books, movies, and TV shows together. It's a bit more casual than this, and it's always fun. That will be on Monday, June 6th at 7 p.m., and again, that's on Zoom. And some of our other book club options include the Saturday Morning Book Club, which the next one will be on Saturday, June 11th at 10 a.m. And that book group is reading L.A. Weather by Maria Amparo Escondon. On Monday, June 13th, you could join the Science Fiction Fantasy Book Club at 7 p.m., where they will be discussing Vicious by V.E. Schwab. And finally, on Wednesday, June 22nd at 7, the Wednesday Night Book Club will be discussing Girl, Woman, Other by Bernadine Evaristo. And that one will be back in person for the first time in two years. So we're excited about that. To see all of the Waltham Public Library programs, please visit our website for more information and to get Zoom links when applicable. And as always, please support our Friends of the Waltham Public Library. The Friends of the Library is one of the most generous friends groups I've been lucky enough to encounter. Thanks to them and their support of a professional Zoom account, which allows for YouTube streaming, we can host programs on YouTube such as this one. So I encourage you to please be a friend. And without further ado, we will get started and Greg is going to kick off our discussion today. Thank you. Um, so let's get this show on the road. Here we go. And play from the start. All right, so um, this is actually kind of nice advertisement uh, because one of the books I read happened to be Vicious, uh, which is the, as Amber just uh, pointed out, is uh, the next book we're gonna be talking about in science fiction um, and fantasy. So um, just to give you a quick summary, because I don't wanna to reveal too much. Um, Vicious is the story of Victor and Eli. And they are two very intelligent um, college students who are just on the cusp of graduating. And they pretty much have all the options available to them, whatever school, whatever like career or job they want, um, they are going to get They're the best of the best in their school. Um, and they both like trade off on who's like the top student. And the only thing that stands in their way is a thesis. A thesis. Ugh. And um, essentially what that is, is um, I mean, what essentially they want to, they decide on because it's kind of a group thing is they're gonna try to prove that um, superheroes exist. Um, there's a fancier way of saying it, but for lack of a better term, I can't remember it. They think people with powers exist and they're gonna try to prove it. And as they're talking more about it and collaborating and discussing, how to do that, they actually come to the realization, uh, not only that do they exist, but there is a certain way a person can become one. Um, there, there is some, uh, but there's a price to be paid. Um, and they do it, and they're both successful, but there are disastrous results um, that occur, and um, it ends up with, uh, Victor getting, well, ends up with them, Victor doing something horrible and Eli um, pretty much uh, framing him for something even worse. And then uh, Victor ends up in jail. So the book is kind of divided into two um, sections. One is flashbacks pertaining to their time at the university and understanding what happened, what was the exact event that caused this like destruction of their friendship. And the other part of the book is Victor escaping from jail 10 years later, hell bent on getting revenge from uh, on a lie who, while having good 
reasons to keep Victor locked up has not become a pleasant person himself uh, and is using his superpowers for uh, great destruction. Um, it's, it's a very quick read. Um, it's not what I'd consider an especially short book, but I read this in about, I'd say like um, about two days. Uh, I think it is very, it's very well written. Um, I really like, they have some really cool ways of how people use their superpowers. Um, Victor's is a particularly uh, terrifying superpower as well as, a, as an interesting one. Um, but uh, it's, it's just kind of like a study on like the deterioration between two friends and how they both have these long I term ideas. And uh, to quote Jeff Goldblum uh, or paraphrase from him, they were smart enough to do, uh, do these things, but they never thought about whether or not they should do these things. Um, and as a result, there's a lot of suffering in people's wake. Um, again, Victor's kind of the focus of it. He's the protagonist, but really the only reason he's the, I guess you could consider him the good guy, but not really. The only reason he's, you could even consider him rooting for him is because Eli has kind of devolved into something so much worse. Um, but they're, despite that, they're both, well, Victor's very likable. He's a very affable individual. Um, I don't think I'd want to meet him in Dark Alley though. Uh, but yeah, um, if you want to talk more about it, uh, come to the sci-fi meeting. I had a blast. Um, speaking about prices to be paid, we're going to go on to my next book. Needful Things by Stephen King. Um, yeah, it's a, as you can tell, this is a not a cheery one. Um, it takes place in um, Stephen King's uh, fictional uh, town of Castle Rock. Um, it's this, uh, it's essentially this small town in Maine, surprise, surprise, um, where bad things occasionally happen. I know, even more surprises. Um, and this, uh, but Castle Rock actually gets like an even worse scenario occurring for it than usual, which is really saying something, though uh, it doesn't start out that way. Um, you see, there's a shop that's opened up in town called Needful Things, hence the title, and it's run by this gentleman by the name of Leyland Gaunt. Um, Leyland is a proprietor of like trinkets and artifacts and, and just kind of cool things, you know, like... A, Normally a useful, a useless gift shop that you see, but it's kind of fun. You go that, you go there just to get like like something of a souvenir to go on back. But the thing is, is that Leland's shop is a. Um, if you go in there, you're going to pretty much see the one thing you really want, and it's going to just be right out of your price range. Um, and if it's out of your price range, Leland's willing to sell it to you. For something else. Um, and uh, he's, well, if you've read any, you know, stories about pertaining to making deals with supernatural entities, you kind of know where this is going. Um, nothing good. Um, so, you know, I'm not really thinking this is a spoiler, but the, the book is very much suggesting that if, if Gaunt isn't the devil, he's, he's definitely working for him. Um, but what I kind of like about this whole like this whole like story is is that, you know, I've every story I've read about making deals with the devil and things like that, I've always kind of left my head scratching. Like, why would you ever make a deal with something like that? I mean, if if he's powerful enough to give you what you want, there's it's almost like a certainty that he's going to take your soul and you know bring you way to, somewhere way down south if you catch my drift. Um, but the way that Gaunt does it is kind of even more insidious. He's not asking for somebody's soul. He asks for people to do a, him a favor or a prank. And it's a seemingly harmless prank. Um, for example, there's a boy who wants like a really rare baseball card. And what he does is, is he goes, okay, I'll give you this card. But what I want you to do is go to um, uh, Wilma, kind of the town gossip on the street and, um, you know, mess up her windows. Seems kind of harmless, you know, it's not great. I mean, obviously, but it seems like a harmless little prank. But what the kid doesn't realize is that Wilma has been having a fight with her, um, with her uh, next door neighbor, uh, Nina, and there was a 
conflict between them and Nina had made like a comment about her windows. And now Wilma thinks that Nina has destroyed her windows and it just, you know, spirals into like a disaster that will leave like half the town burning. Um, and the only person who seems to be uh, understanding what's going on is the uh, sheriff, Alan Pageborn, and he's doing everything he can to stop this guy. But unfortunately, Gaunt's been around for a really, 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 really long time and has a few tricks up his sleeve. Um, it is a very, it is a very unnerving book. I mean, obviously, you know, the de when you have a story that involves the devil making deals with people, that's kind of spooky. But the thing that is kind of, I think, heart-wrenching heart for me is that uh, it kind of shows the uglier side of people where it doesn't take a lot for people to turn on each other, at least in this story. And he just knows how to push people in the push, push people's buttons in the right way to get people to just do awful things. Um, this is one of my favorite Stephen book, King books of late. However, I do want to warn you that this is, it, it's, it's hard to read sometimes because it is, bad things happen to people uh, and animals and uh, no one is uh, safe from uh, Gaunt, um, including any age range. So if you, if you, just to warn you, just to warn folks about that, because uh, if, if you are sensitive about those subject matters, which is totally understandable, I wouldn't recommend it. Um, but if you do want to read a really fascinating story involving, you know, Faustian bargains, uh, this is one of the better ones I've uh, read, though uh, it is going to make me think twice about going to uh, a gift shop anytime soon. So um, thank you. And uh, I'm going to turn it over to Amber. Thanks, Greg. I was trying to think of what quote your your movie quote, what Jeff Goldblum movie that was from. And then I thought it could be like all of his movies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was thinking of Jurassic Park. That was the, uh, that was the one. <laughs> that was, I figured it was Jurassic Park and I thought, well, it could also be The Fly or it could be. Yeah, oh geez, yeah, that, that one too. That would have, that works well, oof. Thank you. Thanks. So I will share my screen now. And hopefully you're all seeing a picture with how the word is passed. Excellent. So the first book I'll talk about is How the Word is Passed by Clint Smith. In this book, Clint Smith visits nine places connected to the legacy of slavery. Among them, the Louisiana State Penitentiary, also known as Angola, a maximum security prison built on the site of a former plantation. Monticello, the former home of Thomas Jefferson, which was built through the labor of enslaved people and the Whitney Plantation, which is the only uh, former plantation that focuses on the lives of the enslaved. Um, for too long, I think I've thought about slavery in the abstract. It's something we're taught existed a long time ago, as though there are no lasting effects today. And through the visits to each of these places, however, Smith shows otherwise. It's beautifully written. It's clear that um, Smith is a poet, but the book is nonetheless difficult to read as it should be. Um, I listened to this on audio and um, you know, you get three weeks with it. I didn't make the, it through the book in the first three weeks and kind of took a break and then checked it out again so that I could finish it. So it did take me a little while to get through it. Um, however, I purchased a copy of it so that I can go back to it because I, really feel that this is a book that needs to be revisited often and so that I can continue to fully attempt to understand what slavery was and how it continues to affect nearly all aspects of our society today, to be honest. Um, that too many, I learned too, too much to share here. So I, again, it's, it's a tough book to, to listen to or to read, but I highly recommend it. I think it's one of those books that um, everyone should read. My second book is The Arsonist City by Hala Elian. Um, I came across a New York Times book review for another book I'm reading, and it started with the line, at the heart of many family novels is a house. 
And although it wasn't talking about the arsonist city, it's quite true for this book as well. Uh, Masna and Idris Nazir were newly married when they left behind their families in Beirut and Syria in the 80s for a new life in the U.S. Now with grown children, Idris assembles everyone for one last summer in the familial home in Beirut. His father has recently passed away, and Idris, unbeknownst to the rest of the family, decides to sell the home that's been in their family for decades. Each chapter is told from the perspective of a different family member as we float between the present and 40 years ago when Masna and Idris meet. I found Masna's perspective to be the most compelling. Um, when I was hearing from her or hearing her story, I, I couldn't put the book down. It's, it's a good book. I liked all of it, but I found hers the most compelling. And um, each, each set of characters, though, comes with their own set of secrets. Uh, so uh, this was a book club read, and it was it, I think it's great for book groups. It leads to a great discussion. And um, yeah, I recommend it. It was a good read. Those are the only two I have today. So with that, I will um, send it over to you, Louise. Thank you, Amber. Those sound like excellent books. And Greg's books sound scary. <laughs> okay. Um, although the Schwab one, I think I might read. That one sounds like one I could handle. Um, okay. My first book, this is by Jennifer Close. This is called The Hopefuls. Um, I wanted a book that was light. I wanted it to be before there was a pandemic. And um, I selected this book by Jennifer Close. And I'm very happy that I did. This is taking place during the Obama campaign in Washington, DC. Um, I would call this a great beach read or a light read. If you're looking for something with some humor and some romance and some good gossip and some friction, this is the book to pick. Um, I, have, I have since read two other books by the same author. I read uh, The Smart One, which I really enjoyed, and Girls in White Dresses, which I believe is her first book. Um, probably out of the three, that was my least favorite. Uh, the Hopefuls, I liked the best. The Smart One would be my second best, and Girls in White Dresses, although I enjoyed reading it, my third. But they're all good. They're all worth reading. Um, we have two characters, Beth and Matt, who meet at a kind of an upscale bar. And Beth is 29. She um, works for a publisher. Uh, and she is in New York City. But Matt has always wanted to be a politician. Um, he worked for the Obama campaign. He wants to be a politician himself. They moved to DC. This is a tough move for Beth. She's kind of like, what is this with DC? Everybody's talking like inside baseball. Everyone is into politics. And it just feels really weird to her. She feels like a fish out of water. Um, but then she feels better when she meets a couple. Uh, Jimmy Dillon, who's a very charismatic wannabe politician also, and his lovely wife, Ashley, who kind of becomes really good friends with Beth, and Beth's starting to feel better. And then Jimmy gets offered this uh, this position and asks Matt to be his assistant. And so the couples get closer, they move to Texas, and all kinds of hijinks ensue. And it's a strain on the two couples. They're all living in the same house in Texas. And um, Matt is a little bit jealous of Jimmy because he's so charismatic and he's doing so well. And Matt, Matt who's a lawyer, really wants to be a politician, but he hasn't you know, made it yet. And it's kind of a strain on the marriage. It's a strain on the friendship. And um, Jennifer Close, I guess, when she was thinking about this book, she was thinking, gee, what must it be like to be the spouse of a politician? You know, because she was living in D.C. And uh, fun fact, apparently she used to work at Politics and Prose, that bookstore in D.C. Um, anyway, it's a, it's a light read. It's a fun read. Just what the doctor ordered for nowadays, I think. 
Um, okay, the next book I read, this is a really good book. I, this is Zochil, I don't know how to say her name, so sorry. Zochil will say, and I apologize to the author in advance because I think I'm mispronouncing her name. Gonzalez, this is an excellent, amazing book, uh, really worth the read, very interesting plot, um, well-developed characters. Um, we have a, a family of Puerto Rican descent um, and the mother uh, takes off when Olga and her brother Prieto are little because the mother is a political activist a radical political activist who wants to do things to help Puerto Rico. And of course, when Hurricane Maria happens, their um, relationship with the mother gets closer, but the mother kind of abandoned the family. Their father um, is an addict and an alcoholic, uh, and, and that gets worse after the mother leaves. And Prieto becomes a politician, um, uh, works in the Senate, but he is um, gay and he's hiding the gay. He um, gets married so that he'll look quote respectable. And then some, some dark money real estate people have something on him. They have some video of him doing gay things and they, they sort of corrupt him and get him to vote on things the way they want him to vote. Um, and meantime, Olga, is an upscale wedding, wedding planner. So she's planning all these weddings for these really wealthy people. And it's really fun to read about it. And she's also figuring out ways to make money for herself. She's kind of taken a little off the top. And so you're reading about these upscale weddings and all the upscale people and their demands. Um, but things happen for Olga where she maybe rethinks her life. And it's fun to meet her family and her mother is so kind of wild and politically active and that's like all she cares about even more than the kids and so you kind of have mixed feelings about the mother and and you feel for um her brother prieto and um it's just a wonderful wonderful book really interesting um it it does provide us a look at uh, hurricane maria and the the politicians and the greedy people trying to take advantage of people on the island um, we all know during Hurricane Maria, all, we all saw what happened there. Um, and so it's it's a worthwhile read on so many levels. I really highly recommend this. This is an author to follow. And the last book I want to talk about is Cost of Living by Emily Maloney. Um, I believe this is her first book. It's a collection of essays that she's written. Um, she is also a writer to follow. She has a very unique voice. Um, she talks about some a pers very personal story in her life and also her experience working in the medical system, the United States medical system. And the title, The Cost of Living is, it's kind of about the cost of her living something that happens to her, but it's also about the, the cost of medical care and people who can't pay for medical care and what can happen to them in this country and the way the medical system works or doesn't, as the case may be. Emily herself um, uh, saw a psychiatrist in her youth who prescribed so many different medications. Um, one of the medications she prescribed for Emily was lithium, and Emily felt very sick on the lithium. And at some point she just took a huge, massive overdose of lithium and she ends up going to a hospital. Well, it turns out the hospital she went to, she gets this huge five figure bill after she's out. So this is the cost of living. Yes, she lived, they saved her life, but now she has this huge medical bill that she has to work to pay and um, turns out she was misdiagnosed also um, by the uh, by the the doctors. Like it turns out, she really had a hypothyroidism, a vitamin D deficiency, and a neurologically based development developmental uh, uh, issue. And so she's in all this medical debt. She, she was tried on all these different medications that cost a lot of money and it really was a misdiagnosis. And she talks about how, you know, she used to think doctors knew everything and she would just do what they said. 
and she works in an ER and she takes us into the ER and sort of shows us what's happening and, and how they process the patients and how the system sometimes fails people. And um, she talks about going to conventions, medical conventions. Um, she worked as a bioethicist at one point. And it really, it's really a thoughtful, well-written book and it makes us think about the medical system and about medical debt. And also we're just meeting a very interesting and good writer. Um, even the stories about her family are very interesting. She has a kind of a quirky family. Her mother likes to smoke pot and is often encouraging her daughter to smoke pot because it'll make her feel better, she feels. And her father seems to have some sort of depression where he'll just stay in the house for days on end and nobody ever washes the dishes. Emily gets stuck washing the dishes. The otherwise, things pile up in this. Very quirky, very quirky. Um, very good book. I, I really recommend it. And with that, I am going to pass this back to our host. Um, Thanks, Louise. That's a variety of books. Did you read the um, the hopefuls last? Did you say like the light the light one last, or because I feel oh, like after good. your other two, you kind of needed the the light one. Actually, um, I think the hopefuls came. I think after Olga. And the three, the three Jennifer closes were in a row. And then I think uh, was the cost of living. So they yeah. kind of sandwiched. It was like a sandwich. <laughs> you need another lighthearted one after the cost of living. That sounds pretty, pretty sad and very relevant, but, but heavy. Yeah, for sure. Um, and I thinking about the Stephen King title, I lived in Colorado for a long time and I, the library system I worked for, the main branch of that library system was in Castle Rock. And so every time I hear Castle Rock, I think of Colorado and I always forget that they're set in Maine, but I love, um, it, yeah, it's a, just a nice little reminder of my time in Colorado. Have you watched the ser the Castle Rock series, Greg? I have. Um, I watched the first season. I didn't see the second season. Um, it's it seems to be doing something different from what it has. It makes a lot of references to um, a lot of characters who live in Castle Rock, but they don't really seem to be connected. So I guess what I'm saying is, is that if you wanted to watch Castle Rock, but were worried that, you know, about spoiling anything for needful things or other books, don't worry about it because it's really not going to do anything. It's just like, oh, I know that name or mm -hmm. I know that place. That's about, that's about it. Are you watching anything else that's good right now? Any movies or TV shows you want to share? Shoot, um, I brought it. I brought it up uh, before, but I had only just started the series. Um, I'm about finished with uh, the TV series "Our Flag Means Death" um, by Taika Waititi, and it's on HBO right now. Um, I I love it. I it's one of the it's one of like the coolest things I think I've seen in a while. Um, it's also really goofy and also really heartwarming. Um, to sum it up, because I know I've said it before, but it's about the real life. No, it's based off of this uh, gentleman by the name of Steve Bonnet. Um, he was a real life person um, and he decided even though he was a wealthy um, uh, like landowner in uh, Barbados that he was gonna pretty much just abandon his life and become a pirate. Um, he was not a very good pirate um, because he was a nobleman who had no idea about like the, you know, harsh realities of the ocean. Um, yet despite his incompetency, his like, like bumbling of everything possible, he somehow ended up becoming pals with Blackbeard, um, which is kind of crazy, but it's just kind of a focus on that. And it's very, very loosely based. And it's about him trying to become like a captain with everybody like pointing out like, you, you're not really cut out for this. Um, but on the other hand, it also is a surprisingly sweet story about like some um, queer relationships and, and to the point where um, there's, 
I, I, it's kind of hard for me to describe it, but it is just like, incre it's surprisingly sweet. And I did not expect this from being like a pirate fro. I did not expect like a romantic comedy in my pirate story, but I'm all the glad for it. Um, there is one character who's like, who feels like he should be in a dark gritty pirate series, but he's like standing out there. And I think somebody pointed out like, uh, he's like the one human character in that, in a Muppet film, because there's always one, you know, you have Michael Caine and like a Christmas Carol and you have uh, Tim Curry and Muppet Treasure Island. He's just like the one serious straight man. And it's, it's freaking hilarious. So um, if uh, <laughs> it's, it's, I just, um, I, I can't recommend it enough. It's it's really it's really lovely. Louise, are you watching anything you want to talk about, or any and movies or TV that you've seen recently? Well, um, none of these are are particularly new, but I watched a good one on Canopy called Catherine O. Canopy is a streaming media platform that you can get from our library, where you can watch lots of films documentaries, um, the great courses, things like that. I, I really like Canopy. Um, and Catherine O oh was a really, really fun movie, I thought, um, about these two best friends. And um, Catherine really wants to be a dancer. She's got a sort of an apprenticeship in this dance company. This is in New York City. And um, her roommate actually gets a place in, I believe it was Tribeca that she really wants and, and leaves. So now the roommates are separated, which is difficult. And Catherine really wants a position in her dance company, but they tell her they'll have to let her go. She won't get to do the Christmas show. So this is really hard for her. And uh, she ends up taking a job at the school that she went to, like serving, uh, for dinners and being an RA and things like that, just to get money. And her friend meantime gets engaged to a, a kind of a wealthy guy and they move to Japan. And so um, it's kind of about how Catherine comes to terms with all the changes in her life, but it's very sweet. The woman who plays her, and I'm so sorry, I have to look it up. I don't remember her name, uh, does such a, a marvelous job. It's, it's just a really sweet movie. Um, the other thing, and this is a little embarrassing is I've been watching All in the Family reruns. Um, <laughs> on YouTube and I'm really enjoying them. Um, uh, again, they're a little bit kind of like my Jennifer Close. I mean, I know that that show touched on some issues, but at the same time, it's, it's pretty light and very funny. And uh, I'm just enjoying it as sort of a retro, retro binge watch. <laughs> and that's it. <laughs> I remember that show um, from, I was, young when it was on or maybe cut I, I don't was it the 70s early 80s um and then I I remember the first time I realized that um uh what's the son-in-law uh the daughter Michael yeah Michael he's Stewart. Rob Reiner right it's Rob Reiner like, who became oh so goodness. big yeah yeah I, it was kind of my mind I couldn't fully so it was the the character with like I just I remember thinking what well, that's <laughs> no way no way that's him <laughs> Um, that's funny. I haven't seen one of those in a long time. Um, I'm watching to talk about maybe a little embarrassing, uh, two teen dramas, clearly not the demographic for either of these, but I absolutely love them. Um, I'm watching both with my oldest daughter. So I have a little, I feel a little bit uh, of an excuse, but I would honestly, I would watch them on my own anyway. Uh, the first one's called Never Have I Ever. And I, it's on Netflix. I just finished. We just finished season two, and um, it's it's great. It's got a great soundtrack. It's very clever. It's funny. There are some very poignant moments. Um, and then I'm late to this party, but we just started watching Riverdale, and this is just like, you know, I, I wasn't super into the Archie comics, but funnily enough, I know all the characters. So like when Josie and the Pussycats come on, I'm like, oh, that's Josie and the Pussycats. How do I know that? I don't know, but I do. Um, and, you know, it's it's just, it's dark and it's good. It's got, you know, my daughter loves it, but then, you know, it's got Luke Perry, who, um, you know, I had forgotten that he was in this and um, it's nice to see him. You know, he's no longer with us. Um, Robin Givens is in it in a couple of the episodes, which kind of blows my mind. Um, and then 
we just we're just about to finish season one and Molly Ringwald is Archie's mom and she comes in and so I'm just um, very captivated by the show I think it's also super smart I think that um, it's like never have I ever it's got a great soundtrack I've been listening to both of the the music from the show on Spotify for both of these shows um, so you know I've got I think we have six or seven seasons I just announced that they're stopping Riverdale, but we've got a lot of Riverdale to get us through the summer. So I'm pretty excited about that. And then I'm going to see, um, uh, for the first time since early 2020 or 2019, we're going to the movies this weekend to see Top Gun. <laughs> I already bought my tickets in case it's, you know, um, hard to get tickets. My parents are coming to town and my mom said, can we go see Top Gun? So we're going I think we rewatched, you know, Top Gun uh, last summer. It's okay. I don't remember loving it when it first came out either. I know some people do, and it's a, it, it, you know, it's 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 a fun movie. I think that um, I'm I'm really looking forward to seeing this on the big screen. I didn't see the first one in the movie theater, so I think it'll be just a nice holiday weekend thing to do. I'm really excited to be the idea of going back into a movie theater is great. So um, yeah, but that's it. I have not watched any good. I haven't watched any movies period recently, I don't think. So it'll be fun. Anything else either of you want to share before we end the discussion? I think I'm good. No. All right. Well, as always, it was a pleasure. You both read the most interesting um, titles. So thank you. And to all of you watching, thank you. And we'll see you next month. Take care.